I'll go with the usual caveats. These are my opinions, not necessarily those expressed of my company. Okay, just to cover that one. <laughs> All right, so what have I discovered? Um, damn, lots of things, okay? Lots of rabbit holes. Everybody's looked into AI. It's rabbit hole, rabbit hole, full war and everything. It's quite a difficult thing to go find. Um, I've learned that there's more to learn than I yet understand, which is I'm going to call generally life, okay? Keep learning. Um, there's definitely more questions I've come up with than I found answers to. And each, this is some of them. So what I've got here is a, some of the thoughts I've come up with as I've been going through this process. And, and it's quite a, yeah. Let's call it philosophical direction. And I'm glad this morning some of my philosophical directions other people have had. So I don't feel quite so weird and alone. Um, AI, if we look at it, is already very capable. But ultimately, where does it end up? How far can it go and what can it do? Okay. Um, there is lots of hope. There's lots of hype. And there's an incredible amount of FUD out there. But it's a new technology and everybody doesn't know what to do. So let's go with that one. Uh, and ultimately, what does the future bring? And if I knew, I would be about a mile in that direction and I wouldn't be here. OK, you go and make money somewhere else instead of doing this thing. All right, so let's have a look at this. A couple of quiz questions. Who thinks AI is the next great thing? This is audience participation, by the way. It's the next, great, great, next best thing. Uh, welcome with open arms. Absolutely no qualms about it. Uh, you are a Gen Z, as they call whatever the Gen Zs, the young kids nowadays. Just, I don't know what they call my children. Um, use it faithfully, no questions asked. OK. Group of engineers. Let's look at it then. OK. So that we're actually concerned about what it brings and the rate of change and the seemingly few checks and balances. Go on. So a couple of people are concerned, right? OK, that's OK. Um, how many of us actually think then that AI is an inevitable part of product development and it's something we're going to have to learn to live with and work with? Now, everybody should be putting their hand up at this point in time because it is inevitable, I think, especially after this morning's discussion. All right, so let's have a look at a few, few background things. Demographics. Why have I gone to demographics? There's a really interesting, really interesting topic, isn't there? So look at the curves. What does it say? Ultimately, it says that, um, so you've got basically uh, G7 and BRICS, effectively, uh, plus one rather large growing nation in the bottom corner, OK? Look at the population curves, OK? So think that we're engineers, we're already a niche. Uh, we're in security, we're in a niche. We're in AI in security. We're in a niche of a niche of a niche, OK? And population is shrinking. But product development and the complexity of product development has not got any shorter, OK? It's getting harder. So kind of, in my view, infers somewhere along that curve that we're going to have to leverage something to help that keep going. Yeah, just by looking at where, where things are at in the world and what we do to make, make and create products. Okay. AI economically, um, it's being hailed as this great hope. It's going to it's just going to create infinite wealth. It's going to mean that we can all retire early. We're never going to have jobs. We're never going to do anything. Yeah, maybe. OK, let's, let's see on a maybe on that one. We're going to live our life of leisure. Uh, ultimately, the alternative is that we, we could end up with uh, job functions being taken over partially or completely. OK, does that result in mass unemployment? Does it result in people being happy as ever because they don't have to work? Well, we don't know yet. Let's face it. Um, if you've got those companies and, and, and some industries, if you look at it, let's look at the um, uh, strike in the US with, the, with the, the film writers and things, okay? Absolutely scared to death of what AI is going to bring in their marketplace. And the potential, therefore, is that, that current functions may get replaced by some form of AI, okay? It may be that there isn't the skills, and it may be that people just want to cut down on jobs, and they want to use it and utilize it to, to have less people. And then in the back of my mind, you're going, mm, okay, but what then, what's the socioeconomic impact of that? Where does that leave people? You know, people are strange things. We're biologicals that need things to do. OK, it's a great idea of having a life of leisure, but how many people get bored at the weekend? Because they're not at work, right? And it's many of us, because we're itching to do something. We need something to do, OK, because there's nothing to go and do. So there's those kind of things that kicks in with it. Where does it, where does it take us? Now then, so if I let an AI completely and wholly create my product, Who's responsible? Because at the moment, somewhere in this loop, a human or a human-based entity called a company 
is liable for that product in the marketplace. So if an AI has created it, is it liable? Because it's a thing, it doesn't exist. So where does that product liability sit, bit sit? You know, where does an engineer sit within that? So I look at this as going, at the moment, until law changes, engineers are OK because they're going to have to have somebody to blame, almost, for that product not being correct in an, our engineering sense. OK, so it sort of infers that somewhere in the loop of a product coming out, a human will need to be in that loop. They're going to need to make some oversight decision, some, some action, some corrective decision, something along that lines that says, yeah, we know what the AI's done. OK, it's got trust. It's... We, we know what it's created. That's kind of where I'm, I'm heading with that one. Um, but to do that, we've got this issue of significantly fewer engineers. And if I've got significantly fewer engineers and they've got product acceleration coming out and they're more complex and the security landscape's changed and all of these factors that build up, how do they learn that? How do they get those skills in place to keep up with that product acceleration? Because if the AI has created something very quickly, They've got to try and come to decision equally as quickly to get the product on the market. And they've got to build that skill. So they can't be of zero skill. They've got to be able to question this creation and use it to their advantage. And then are they going to use an AI to actually get that knowledge in a shorter time frame? Okay? I mean, those of us who've got teenagers, chat DPT, biology homework, right? Okay? <laughs> Uh, and I read an interesting one the other day with it, exactly that. Somebody put it in there, did all their homework with it, but it fundamentally gave them completely the wrong answers, right? Uh, and this is teenagers asking teenagers these questions. Uh, didn't do their homework, had to stand up in class and talk about the thing they'd learned. So they got ChatGPT to write their speech, and then they got asked questions, which they had absolutely no idea about, because they didn't actually know anything. And so we can't be in a position where I'm going to question what's been created without the knowledge but I can leverage what it's got to help me get there faster, maybe, if I can learn to trust it. So there's all these twists and conundrums that go around in my mind of, of what do we do. Um, and ultimately, I've got those things going. Lots of us will get to the point where you know, the tail end of that curve says there's lots of people going to retirement and there's less people filling in the bottom. How many of us struggle to get uh, new people to fill technical posts? Yeah, it's a problem. It's quite a difficult challenge. So how do we do that? And that's maybe where we've got to help backfill it. And do we get to this point where product, the products are just too difficult to create and I've got this easy life path so I can get universal basic income and I can sit there and, and not do anything? Engineering is just too hard. Okay. But I still want my iPhone. I still want my software. Create, I still want something. Yeah, so there's these whole series of conundrums. All right, licensing then. Um, so this one I keep scratching my head out, and I just don't know the answer to it. So I'm going to throw things on the board, and people can tell me I'm wrong. Um, open source is free and available. I can use it. Okay, Use as this little thing called a license wrapped around it. Okay, And we're going through the whole SBOM thing that we put the paper out for last year, and that was an interesting, an interesting process to learn that side of things. And so if said AI is learning from code which is coming with a license, when does the license bit kick in with the AI generated code? And does it come with a license? And if somebody pulls out from that process and says, I don't want my code in your training repository, does it back affect it? And, and there's all these little conundrums that I, I, I don't have an answer to. And then when somebody can educate me on it, I'm happy to take the education because it's that ooh, interesting one. And then what's the license terms with the generative tool that I'm looking at that's creating it? And who then owns what it creates? And, and so all those little things kick into, I'm liable for what I put in my product and the license that goes with it, which is all the SBOM discussions we've been having for a while. Okay, so it's all those little things that kick in. Um, so you know, who owns what sort of starts to kick into the, kick into the process. <coughs> then we get to garbage in, garbage out. There's lots of code on the web. Who tested it? Who knows it's any good? But people will grab it and use it and hope it works because it's a quick and easy fix on a Friday when I'm under pressure. It shouldn't be, but it is. Yeah, we should be vetting what comes into our development cycle and we should be putting in a trusted domain and we should be making sure it's right, but we don't always because we're under time pressure. Okay, because that's kind of the way that it always works. And so if I'm training this thing on unvetted data, 
does the AI know to know that and it kind of compensates for it and actually makes it better in the first place or does it come out with garbage itself? Because that's what it knows. Well, humans created this code, so I'll move, create the same stuff. All I'll do is learn how to put it together. Uh, and, and that bit is a bit of AI I have yet to fully understand. Um, and, and some of the code when you listen to comments might also be the same case. Okay. Um, but it might well be the fact that it it's generates enough knowledge to actually perfect the rubbish it was given in the first place and go, well, I know it was rubbish, but I can perfect the code in my training model. I mean, that would be an interesting conundrum, wasn't it? It fixes what, was, what it was trained on uh, and might be the case. All right, so let's look at it within the design cycle. So I, I made a little diagram last year um, and it's very complicated and it doesn't fit on the screen very well. Um, but it's kind of, in my view, all of manufacturing and development and what we should be doing and how we feed things in and, and, and then where can AI help? Which when you actually evaluate it is probably pretty much everywhere in some way, shape or form. Different things for different purposes, different helpers, different tools that will get me where I want to be. But ultimately there's many, many places that you can leverage what knowledge it brings and the speed at which it can do that to help me move forward. Um, are they there yet? Do we have them yet? No. So it's kind of a little bit abstract, maybe fuzzy thinking on my part, but they are all there, okay? Um, so lots of things to go at. Things that do exist. So we know that copilots exist, or copilots exist. They are available. You've got the GitHub copilot, you've got um, ChatGPT. They all claim to be the best thing ever. Again, we'll go back a few slides to the garbage model. Do we know exactly what it creates is great? I don't know yet. Um, and then we get to the point of, when it creates code, is it creating me a small section of code to do a little task, or do I want it to let it run loose and give me a whole middleware stack or a whole application? I don't think it's quite there to do it yet, but it's not beyond the bounds of possibility that it could eventually. Um, how far do you want it to go? And then I look at it and go, well, hmm. So if it does that, can it create me a full Bluetooth stack, a full TCP IP stack? Um, and then when I ask it to do it the next time, is it like version controlled so it's the same based on the last one or does it just come up with a whole new idea? And then how do I test that? And how do I know if I'm gonna put that out in the field and how much variation is in there? Because I kind of want a bit of a stable code base and I don't wanna to have to sit there and have this test burden each time to go back and look at it. How do I go back round that loop? So there's that whole hmm, scratching my head on that one as well. And it was mentioned a point this morning it was raised on, on part of this. I think whether Nick brought it up. Um, you know, and we can go into, I can put it within a, in, a, in a current method of doing a controlled CICD system, and that's currently how we do it. But do they need to advance so that that can be done in a more adaptive way so that I can cope with different inputs and different things that come in? So, so many questions. Um, I'd like answers if everybody can help me. Um, and then this one, because I, I, I'm a hardware guy at heart who looks at other things, okay? So, and I look at, this from a, look at this from a PCB design perspective, complete with making a product to putting software in that device. And so, do we get to a point where I, uh, I go to ChatGPT or whichever, choose your favorite um, generative tool, um, and say, create me a Bluetooth temperature monitor? Yeah? Now, technically, if you think about it, it's not that difficult. I need a Bluetooth chip, I need a stack, I need an antenna, I need a battery, I need a package to put it in, and I've got to write something to read the temp sensor, which might actually be in the Bluetooth part already. So today, arguably, you could probably get 80 or 90% of the way there pretty quickly and easily. And when you actually really analyze hardware and layouts and tools and antennas, a lot of them are really cut and pasted. You could regenerate a lot of things very quickly. Whether engineers choose to or refuse to is a different discussion, but we could, okay? But basically there's a lot, enough information almost now to do it without worrying about it being a generated tool. We could just take standard information and have it in a system, which is part of design and code reuse. So lots of words on this one. I tend to write these so you can read them afterwards because I know you won't forget, okay? Or you will forget. So if I narrow it down and say, create me an energy monitor with a given temperature range, with a given accuracy that's going to sample every a given time, and it's got to have a battery life of X years. Now I've expanded my parameters. 
Okay, now that's when that tool might come in better because it can go away and go, right, well, I know that to get that, I need to have this size of battery, but you've given me this mechanical parameter, so it can only be this big. So I need a stack that's going to start in this time that gives me this amount of energy consumption that does this, this, this. And it can do all of that while you're making the coffee because it can go and look at historical data that exists out for all these products and all of these things that are created and pulled back in from data that comes from currently released devices and go and leverage that. So to my view, it's perfectly plausible that you could get to that stage. Are we there today? No. Could we be fairly soon for simple devices? OK, this is a simple device I chose on purpose. Um, yeah. Could we get to the point where I say, um, I've done all of that. It's decided which part I choose, which isn't great for a vendor that it's not chosen our part, by the way. But um, that's OK. It's one of, these, one of these life systems you have to deal with. Um, but it chooses all of that based on the parameters that it's looked at to make the, the right decision for that product that you've asked for. Okay? Um, you could then say, well, I'd like it to look like, uh, look like this physically. I want it to make it look like a, an Apple product, okay? and it has a nice white box, and it looks beautiful and sleek. It's a design parameter that, that's known. It can come up with that so it knows the mechanical size, it knows the height dimensions, it knows how to package it. They're not beyond the realms of thought to come up with these things. Arguably, I need an app to run with this because it's a Bluetooth part. It could probably work out more about GUIs and interfaces than we could work out and let the marketing department loose on based on what actually works from all the millions of apps and all the millions of users. So it could potentially do that as well. Okay. So I, I'm going to arguably 80% plus of that design could be auto-generated with the engineering team fitting in the, the funky bit that you want to do, the place your code here kind of analogy, okay, to make that little bit of source that you come into. But most of it, with most products, many things are very much the same in many products that come out. Okay. I did admittedly choose a simple one because it's a one-chip one wonder. All right, so um, trust. Um, trust but verify or zero trust until verified. Which do we choose? Okay. So... If we're looking at security um, and we've got this thing being created for us by an AI, how do we know from a security perspective what vulnerabilities are in there? It's generating it for me. Does it go off and do all that work for me and do all the CVE checks and do all the back testing? And I well, don't know because it's generated it. Where, where's its history? Because it's created something new potentially. So there's all those kind of thoughts that, um, that we look at. <coughs> If I trust it to create me some code, um, well, obviously, it's an AI, so it's smarter than we are because it's got more knowledge than I'll ever be able to put into my brain, and, and it can just go and get it at its fingertips on the data center kind of thing. Um, but can it perform all those risk assessments for me? Can it do a threat model for me? Can it do all the things that we need to do to say, how is this product going to go out, which is back to the product liability and back to the product development side of it. When it goes out into the market, how do we trust it in the marketplace to do what it's going to do? How does it get managed after that? And absolutely, if you think about it back to the, the design model a few slides ago, um, all those things are in a loop where they can feed back through and I can make use of them and it can leverage what's going on. You can have a tool looking at vulnerabilities and feeding that back into the developers and all those things can happen. Um, do I leave it to run free and just create me the product and off I go and I sit there at the back peeking and poking at it to make sure what it's created is correct. It's kind of an interesting scenario in a few years' time as a developer of, of what, which bit are they doing. And actually, many, much of it may be verifying what's been created and having a human sitting there as the overlord of checking, if you like, to make sure that it's, it's ethically correct, potentially, or otherwise, and it meets the requirement of what you want to put on the market. Then we get to test side of things. So um, theoretically, you should be absolutely fantastic at very rapidly testing for me. Okay? And lots of test scenarios that it could do for us, which we couldn't conceive of and achieve in the time frame that it's got. Okay? So we can actually potentially let it run free there. But again, trust and verify that it does it. How do we go back again to this, who's monitoring it? So we've got to put that back in. Who's going to make its decisions and confirm that what it's done is correct? Um, Put it into this kind of context is, is which hat does the AI wear? Well, it depends on context, potentially. We know we're going to get bad actor AIs because it's out there. 
Okay, AI is released, it's done. You can't put the genie back in the bottle. Okay, so we're going to have bad ones. We're going to have the grey guys who are going to sit there and be in both worlds. I'm going to have the it's classic analogies, yeah. And the poor old developer who's going, oh, what do I do? I'm going to make a product. I don't even know what security is, which is kind of where we're at today potentially with many. Um, so how do we help those guys get that chain? And can the AIs help that? And can they help in that security of the product by having this ability to go up and down and traverse all this, this information, all this capability. Um, was mentioned a bit earlier as well, which is again, you know, I've got all these devices I've put on the market and they're going to have data that's coming in. How do I trust it? How do I get that? How do I stop it being poisoned and then potentially poisoning my feedback model that's helping me generate my next, my next product? So all those things again, potentially needs to be looked at about how do I do that? But AIs are going to be fantastic at spotting that data because it's data at that point, it's doing, its, doing its, what it's in its realm. So ultimately, a couple of conclusions, a bit of a meandering chat, as it were. Um, I think ultimately, the advent of AI coming into product development is almost inevitable, okay? And it's got good and bad points that hopefully I've kind of mused around. Uh, the genie is out of the bottle. It's already released, we can't stop it. It doesn't matter if we legislate against it in certain countries other countries won't. And even that, who cares? People break laws, right? The code's out there, they'll go, and, they'll go and make use of it. These things exist. So can we stop it? No. Can we harness it? That's a different discussion. So how do we harness it for what we need it for, okay? And ultimately, uh, will it enhance what we've got? Will it provide better quality? Will it protect our users? Um, will it give us this dystopian perfect future? Verdict's out. Thank you. <laughs>